Hi, I'm Jeff Rathermel, and in this video, I'm going to talk about paste papers. This method of decorating paper was used in the 16th century and sometimes was called prints in paste because the colored paste was applied to a block and then printed off by hand. Several methods of making designs without the use of a block were used in the 17th and 18th centuries throughout Europe, particularly in Germany. Many traditional bookbinders practiced this craft to design their own end papers for their hardbound books. Paste paper is made by applying a thick pigmented paste to paper and raking or stamping into it to create patterns. It is called paste because it is a medium that bonds to the paper. The beauty of this technique is that it allows for a considerable working time in which to develop a design, since the paste medium dries slowly and can be worked into or over while it is still wet. There are many possibilities in terms of the surface designs that you will be able to create. They can be as simple or as complex as you want. You can use paste papers in the same way you would use any type of decorative paper in book binding, book arts, or any other paper crafts. What I particularly like about paste papers is that the materials are inexpensive and they can be created in a home studio. You can use a variety of papers, but you should be mindful of a few conditions. First, because we're going to be wetting the papers, they should be strong. If they're weak when they're dry, they're going to be weaker when they're wet. Another consideration is the weight of the paper. When you add paste, you're adding girth to the paper. If it cracks when folded when it's dry, this will only be accentuated after the paste dries. If you are using the paper to cover book boards, it should be a thinner paper and lighter in weight. This will allow sharp corners. The white paper that I'm using in this video is a Canson mixed media paper that's 98 pound or 160 gram. There are a number of different mediums that you can use for paste. In this video, I'll be using three. Cornstarch, flour, and wallpaper paste. To color the paste, I will be using acrylic paints. These can be expensive or inexpensive and can be found in art and craft stores. In terms of health and safety, paste papers are quite safe. The materials that we're using are mostly water soluble and some are even food products. You might want to wear gloves to avoid staining your hands. The only caution I would provide is not to use powdered pigments. These are finely ground minerals that are easily inhaled. I'm going to begin by preparing cornstarch paste. To do this, I am taking one cup of cold water and one cup of cornstarch and mixing them together well. I add the cornstarch and the water to each other a little at a time to reduce the possibility of clumping. Cornstarch mixes easily into water without too many lumps.
In my kettle, I have seven cups of water that I have brought to a boil. And I'm gonna add that to a bowl and then slowly mix in my cornstarch and cold water mixture. Again, like before, I'm going to mix a little bit at a time to avoid any clumping. Once you have mixed all of the cornstarch mixtures together, you're going to let that sit and cool. Don't try to use it if it's too warm. It should be about room temperature. The paste will thicken as it cools. To make flour paste, we're starting with the same process, taking one cup of flour and gradually adding one cup of cold water, mixing well. I'm using a super fine, super sifted cake flour, but you can use regular all-purpose flour. Just make sure to sift it beforehand. In my pot, I have seven cups of water that I've brought to a boil. I will add the mixture slowly. Unlike the cornstarch paste, flour needs to be cooked for about 10 minutes. While cooking the mixture, make sure to stir constantly to avoid any scorching that might occur. Once it has finished cooking, let the mixture cool to room temperature. Like the cornstarch, it will thicken as it cools. Mixing wallpaper paste is going to vary based on the brand and the formulation. In my case, it's a methyl cellulose base that can be mixed with cold water. Like the other paste, I gradually add the granular mixture to cold water and mix thoroughly with a whisk. The mixture will thicken as it sits. Here's a comparison of the three paste after they've cooled. The first is the cornstarch. It has a very silky consistency with very few lumps. This is the flour. It has a more gelatinous feel to it. It will require more mixing when we add pigment. The final is the wallpaper paste. It is smooth and quite clear. You can use any type of acrylic paint to color the paste. I'm using a variety of different types, including expensive ones down to the really cheap kind that are quite watery. The intensity of your final color is going to depend on the quality of the paint and then also the ratio that you add. Here are a variety of different acrylic paint types added to our three pastes. The first, the black, is the cornstarch. The second, the green, is the flour. 
And the third, the peach, is the wallpaper paste. You can use acrylic metallic paints to color your paste, or if you want a more intense effect, you can use powdered pigments. These are safer than the powdered color pigments because they are larger in size and less likely to be inhaled. I'm using a pigment called Perlex for one of the paints for the gold and then for the other I'm adding a pearlescent pigment from Twin Rocker Paper Making Supplies. You'll notice that to both of these I've added a little bit of an acrylic paint. This provides more of a base for the reflection of the pigments. It's a good idea to store your paste, whether they're raw or colored, in a cool place. I tend to put mine in the refrigerator. You'll notice that after they cool, they may separate. Here's an example of some cornstarch paste that I took out of the fridge. It's fine to have that watery breakage on it. You just need to mix it well before using it again. Now that our paste is prepared and colored, it's time to prepare the paper. I like to put mine on a board and tape it down to prevent any kind of warping or cockling during the drying process. It's important to wet the paper before you apply the paste. It doesn't take a lot. Just a little bit on a sponge and a quick wipe. I 
I thought it would be interesting to take a look at how our three different pastes work on the paper. I've taken equal amount of paste to paint and I'm applying it to the paper in somewhat equal dabs. From right to left, we have the cornstarch, the flour, and the wallpaper paste. I'm going to just kind of scrape these colors down because what I'm most interested in looking at is the opacity. After drawing, it was interesting to note that all had about the same effect in terms of their transparency. Now we're going to get into some very basic techniques for paste paper design. The first we're going to concentrate on is brushing. You can really use any type of brush you want. We start by dampening the paper. Whether you see me do it or not in the video, it's always the first step. I'm applying paste with a stick for this first example. And then I'm just wiping it around to evenly coat it with a scraper. For the second example, I'm spreading the paste around with a paintbrush. Personally, I like to use a brush when I'm applying the paste. Once I have the paste down, I'm going to play around with it using a couple of different brushes that I have. Here are the dried results. The second technique that I'm going to talk about, I refer to as scraping. Basically, we're just using any kind of tool to remove paint from the surface of the paper. I've collected a variety of things I've found in my house, there are makeup application sponges, scrapers, little spatula, cotton swabs, and even some tools that are specifically made for this that are rubber tipped.
Applying the paste to the paper is the same for all of the papers made in this video. In this first example, I'm going to do an excessive amount of scraping because what I want to show is that the memory of all of these scrapes persist in the final dried product. In the second example, I'm just having a little bit of freehand fun.
These are the papers after they've dried. For this example, I'm using a small spatula to create a spackled effect. I work with the yellow, allow it to dry a little bit while I decorate the other sheet on the board, and then I go back in and add orange. The effect is quite nice. Here's the dried paper. The third basic technique I refer to as blotting. It involves using any type of material or tool that's going to soak up some of the paste. For this example, I'm using a cotton twine and then pushing it into the paper with fabric. the impression of both the fabric and the twine will be left in the paper. Cotton balls and bath scrubbies produce a real subtle effect that can be nice as a foundation texture for more patterning.
For this final example of blotting, I'm using two different types of papers. The blue is a copier paper, just a simple office supply material. It's pretty lightweight. The goldenrod paper is a cardstock, so it has a little more heft to it. I'll be using plastic products as blotting materials in this one. They aren't necessarily absorbing the paste, as they are just picking it up and removing it from the surface. I've applied blue paste to the goldenrod paper, and now I'm loosely putting on plastic wrap. I'm not tamping it down too much, and I want some real irregularities in this. The plastic wrap is then going to stay on while that paper dries. I'm using one of my favorite materials in paste paper making on the other paper, bubble wrap. It creates a very interesting pattern and it's different every time. Unlike the plastic wrap, this is removed before drying. And here are the final results. Probably the tool that's most associated with paste papers are combs. You can buy them, you can make your own, you can buy some and cut them up, you can create your own combs from cardboard by cutting notches into them. Basically what you're doing is you want to create something that's going to remove the paste in a certain fashion. Combs are great tools for precision and also for allowing you to addition your designs. When it comes to tools for paste papers, I often find a lot of inspiration in the dollar store or if I'm lucky enough to be across the pond in the, uh, the pound stores there. A tool that I really like, I made from a squeegee that I found at the dollar store. It has a cheap plastic blade that I was able to cut with a utility knife. It's really great for creating patterns consistently and quickly. In the second example, I've painted green paste over the canary cardstock to show you that 
you can really create a lot of variation and excitement in a paper just by using a color underneath the paste. Two more examples of using combs as decorative tools, this time on a school grade graph paper. Another type of tool that's useful in creating paste papers are rollers. You can either buy them ready-made or you can make your own. In these examples, I'm using purchased rollers. On the grocery bag, which is very absorbent, I'm using a commercial roller that has a pattern on it, but it's something that you could easily duplicate at home. On the school grade graph paper, I'm using a wood graining tool. While not necessarily a roller, it does create a pattern using a rocking effect. In the video, it's hard to see the patterns that these are creating, but you'll see those in the dried sheets.
For these blue paste papers, I'm using rollers that I've created out of found materials. The first that I'm using is an old foam roller that I've tied string to. The second is a plastic wrap tube that I've glued string around. This is the paper using the plastic wrap tube, and this is the paper using the foam roller. Stamps are really a form of controlled blotting. You could buy them ready-made, you can make your own, or you can just simply use materials you find around the house. In the example I'm showing, I'm using some small hoops that are used for needlepoint that are made out of plastic, and then some little felt circles that I found at the dollar store. Metallic colored paste on darker colored paper creates a dramatic effect. In these examples, I'm using a simple combing process with the gold and stamping with our silver pearlescent paste. A stencil is any tool that acts as a blocking agent. They can be bought or simply be cut strips of paper. Using stencils in paste paper making 
can offer control, but it can also offer a lot of flexibility and happy accidents. I thought it would be fun to show you a sped up process of investigation and discovery. While I didn't have a clear idea in terms of what I was going for in these papers, I'm quite happy with the results. As I've mentioned a couple times, you can find a variety of tools just around your house. Here are a couple of paste papers that I created using some found materials, some of them bound for recycling. I really enjoy making paste papers on top of things that are already printed on. It provides a base for inspiration, but also it is an easy way to get complexity within a design. For the final demo in this video, I'm using a variety of techniques that we've talked about. Pattern paper, I'm over patterning first with ink from Bingo Dots. I am applying multiple colors of paste at the same time. I'm also allowing the paste to dry before I add another layer.
It might be a little overworked, but I like how it turned out. Thanks for tuning in, and I hope you found this introduction to Pace Papers interesting and perhaps inspiring. Take care.